Asthma care has changed over the past few years, and it's important to keep ourselves current. The school community is impacted by asthma, and we need to know how to meet the evolving challenges of this chronic health condition. We're glad that you can join us today as Allergy and Asthma Network collaborates with our colleagues at the National Association of School Nurses to bring you current evidence-based information that applies to all members of the school community, students, families, and school health professionals. This is Sally Schessler, Director of Education for Allergy and Asthma Network. With a strong background in school nursing, I work closely with schools, school nurses, and families to manage asthma at school. I oversee programs and resources at the network, and I'm excited about the tools we have for you to use. We're pleased to welcome two NASN speakers to the webinar today. Nicole Bobo has the privilege of reaching the lives of many children and adolescents that are cared for by school nurses across our nation in her role as the Director of Nursing Education at the National Association of School Nurses. She's been there since the year 2000. This reach has included providing tools, resources, and educational offerings to practicing school nurses, and being a co-author of the NASN Framework for 21st Century School Nursing Practice in 2016. She is the current project director of the five-year CDC-funded cooperative agreement collaboration to support students with chronic health conditions. In this project, NASN is charged with providing technical assistance and professional development to CDC-funded states and NASN constituents at large that are addressing the management of students with chronic health conditions. Prior to NASN, Nicoly has experience as university faculty at Regis University in Denver and University of Louisville in Kentucky, including curriculum development and classroom instruction to both undergraduate and graduate nursing students. Clinically, she has practiced as an adult nurse practitioner and registered nurse in home care, outpatient cardiac re rehabilitation, and inpatient critical care. Liz Clark has over 25 years of experience as a school nurse and in school health services administration. She is currently employed by the National Association of School Nurses as a nursing education and practice specialist. She is a former member of the board of directors of the National Association of School Nurses, past president of the Colorado Association of School Nurses, a nationally certified school nurse, and a fellow of the National Academy of School Nurses. Liz is currently the project lead for the COVID-19 resource development at the National Association of School Nurses. Well, Liz and Nicole, we're just so happy to have both of you with us today. Thank you for joining us. We're gonna be looking at our outline for today's webinar first. Uh, we're gonna have an asthma overview, and that will be followed by a school nurse-led case management. We're gonna look at asthma in the age of COVID-19, and finish up looking at resources for the school nurse. So we'll begin with our asthma overview. And to get going with that, we're going to look at a few asthma facts. 25 million Americans are diagnosed with asthma. That is a large number. And of that, one in 10 children are diagnosed with asthma. So in an average classroom of 20 children, you're going to see at least, or expect to see at least 20 children on Twitter two children of the 20 that have asthma. And, and that still is a significant number. We look at, at $80 billion of annual costs. And the next statistic is the one that hurts my heart the most and I think we need to change the most. And that's that we're still seeing over 3,000 deaths annually from asthma. And we're, the really sad part of it is, is that it's 75% higher for black persons than white persons. This has to change, and we're working towards that every day. 13.8 million missed school days per year are uh, come from asthma. It's the number one reason that children miss school, and that's a CDC statistic for those of you that always want to know where that one came from. We also see 14.2 million missed work days per year. Some of that's caring for a child with asthma. Some of it's out for asthma uh, themselves as an adult. Now, the, another kind of staggering and unfortunate statistic is that three in five people limit their physical activity when they have asthma. 
this is a message we really need to get to our students is that they don't have to limit their activity. They can do anything if they're asthma in control. And as, as school nurses and, and people who do health education, we, it's important for us to note that 71% of people misuse their inhalers. Huge educational opportunity for us. And one in five people cannot afford their medications. That's another sad statistic. Well, as we're looking at understanding asthma, uh, asthma used to be looked at as a single disease, and it certainly is not anymore. Uh, asthma is a syndrome rather than a single disease entity. Environmental and genetic factors lead to inflammation in the lungs, and they cause both highway, airway hyperresponsiveness as well as reversible airway obstruction. And these lead to those clinical symptoms we're so used to hearing at school of coughing, wheezing, dyspnea, and all everything that goes along with asthma. Uh, this picture makes, makes me want to like wheeze myself. But uh, at the network, we like to talk a lot about quiet asthma and noisy asthma. Quiet asthma is that asthma that you're, you don't really see or hear. Uh, it's the inflammation and swelling in the lungs. And the student is sometimes unaware that this is even happening. But as their, their quiet asthma is beginning, they're gonna have that constricted airway and that swelling in the airway so that it becomes more difficult to exchange air. But noisy asthma is where the in irritation triggers bronchospasm. That's that coughing, wheezing, and shortness of breath that we hear, hear and see with asthma. Asthma triggers, uh, we really think about irritants and allergens when we think about asthma triggers. And the irritants are things like the tobacco smoke, strong odors, chemicals. And allergens, we're thinking about animal dander, dust and dust mites. We also see a lot of asthma triggered by a viral respiratory infection. And sometimes it's, it's uh, triggered by a drug, either aspirin, the NSAIDs, propanolol, beta blockers. Uh, there's a lot of things that can trigger asthma. Also, we see it triggered by exercise and we see exercise induced bronchospasm. There's weather changes, the cold air can trigger asthma. And something that sometimes gets missed is that strong emotions can trigger an asthma flare. You know, either, either intense laughing or really intense anger uh, can cause a person to flare with their asthma. Food additives and then uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD. And then sometimes we'll see asthma triggered by rhinitis or sinusitis, but also environmental allergies. The Baylor Healthcare System in Texas put out this marvelous tool for us to use called the Rules of Two. And, uh, and it, it's, it's just a quick and easy way to think about, is a student's asthma in control? So do you have asthma symptoms or use your bronchodilator medication more than two times a week? Do you have asthma symptoms that awaken you more than two times a month? Do you refill your bronchodilator medication more than two times per year? Does your peak flow drop more than 20%, two times 10% when you have symptoms? So if the answer to all the questions is no, you can likely assume that your asthma is in control and you should continue to do what you're doing. But if you answer yes to even one of those questions, it means that asthma is not controlled and you need to really see your doctor to figure out what's the best action to take to try to get yourself into adequate control. Some specific triggers in the school setting can be a strong odor from construction. Uh, I remember one time uh, I was in my health office and we had a flat roofed building and they decided they were going to retire the roof during the school day. And it was a really hot day and a lot of people had their windows open. And I saw so many asthma flares that day. And I went down to the, the principal and I said, I said, I think this has to stop today, please. And he arranged to have it done on a Saturday. And, uh, and so there's a lot of things you can do to make sure that children can breathe well at school. New carpeting can be a problem and, and nail polish and other strong odors. So what the school nurse can do is really assess the student's breathing and look at environmental hazards that might be happening. Also, anxiety can really trigger some, some asthma episodes. And I think especially in this kind of not quite post COVID world, uh, we are seeing a lot of students with anxiety. And so the, here we can assess the student's breathing, but look for those situational stresses 
that might really be affecting the child. And then every school nurse's favorite is when they run the mile. Uh, this is a time where we can pre-medicate them 20 minutes before exercising and assess their breathing so we can set them up for success. But I don't know about all of you, but I certainly saw every student of mine that had asthma the day they ran the mile. So the big three things we want to think about at school are preventing asthma flares, treating them, and managing asthma on a daily basis. So with prevention, we want to look at trigger avoidance. We want to assess the environment. Uh, we want to pre-medicate before intense activity to prevent that asthma flare from ever happening. And when it's time to look at treatment, we certainly can look at that asthma action plan. And if your students come to school that have uh, asthma that needs regular care and they don't have an asthma action plan, I would suggest uh, asking the parent if you can contact the doctor and fax them a copy of an asthma action plan and get that back and, and have that completed for you to use at school. When we think about treatment, we want to think about the right medication in the right device at the right time. And especially for younger students, uh, we really want to see them using some kind of uh, spacer or valve holding chamber to use their inhaler. And for management, we really want to make sure we're concentrating on educating our students on a developmentally appropriate level. And we really want to work every day towards our students being able to self-manage. So at school, we'll just kind of close up this section by mm -hmm. saying we want to think about planning. Planning is actually one of the standards of school nursing practice. We want to think about coordination of care. Uh, that's what we're talking about today. And uh, staff education. Uh, all staff really needs to be educated about the signs and symptoms and potential severity of asthma. This is another one where like, they need to be educated to never send a school, school student alone to the health office. In a neighboring district from where I worked one time, the teacher called the school nurse and said, you know, how's Johnny doing? I sent him down there quite a while ago. And she said, well, you never came to see me. And they found poor Johnny um, passed away in the hallway from an asthma episode. And you really need to make sure they know someone's got to be with these children because things can change quickly. You want to be sure you're providing a safe environment. Uh, this comes down with, with bus idling and again, the tar on the roof. You know, whatever you can do to help mitigate those, those uh, strong odors and fumes. And while we would like to avoid any emergency at school, we do have to be prepared to mount an emergency response and be prepared for an asthma emergency. The other thing is to consider how you want to handle a building emergency for your students with asthma. I always had all my inhalers and bins, and if I had to evacuate the building, all those inhalers quickly went in a rolling suitcase with me and out the door they went with me. So you really want to think about emergency responses. And at this time, I'll call on my friend Nicolie Bobo to lead us through school nurse-led case management. Nicolie? Thank you, Sally, for the overview of asthma and outlining some of the school issues for students with asthma. So next, I want to ask you to consider this question. What guides your approach to caring for a student with asthma at school? What roadmap do you use? For the professional school nurse, the NASN framework provides that guidance. The framework puts the students at the center surrounded by five principles. The principles overlap, none are higher than the others, and each principle has related practice components. Keep in mind the principles and related practice components are meant to create a mindset about the 21st century school nursing practice, not a checklist of behaviors or tasks. It provides you with a roadmap to guide your practice. Another roadmap used in schools is the WISC model, a model school nurses need to be familiar with because it's embraced by your educator colleagues. It replaces the coordinated school health approach, a mainstay of school health since 1987, a model many educators viewed as primarily a health initiative. The WISC model builds on the traditional coordinated school health approach, but places a stronger focus on the child and the intersection of health and education. There are five whole child tenants and 10 components that surround the student, and there's an emphasis on the important role the community plays in supporting the school. The framework is aligned with the WISC model. In particular, it operationalizes the health services component of WISC. 
Both are student-centric, comprehensive in their approach, and depend on collaboration across the home, school, community continuum. The school nurse is poised to coordinate care for students with asthma using a holistic student-centered approach that is both part of the WISC model and the NESN framework. Coordination of care in school for students with asthma requires a deeper dive into the care coordination principle of the NESN framework and the related practice components. And among the practice components of care coordination, case management led by the school nurse is of particular importance for the student with asthma. Confusion exists in the literature over how care coordination and case management are defined. NASN clearly differentiates the two. The practice component of case management of the care coordination principle is a collaborative approach to provide and coordinate school health services. It involves shared planning with the student and family. It's goal-oriented based on the needs of the student. It involves the child's personal and school health teams. Case management strategies help deal with, prevent, and or reduce the occurrence of health problems, are proactive and comprehensive, and address both health and academic goals. And most importantly, these strategies are outlined in a student's individualized healthcare plan. Case management finds solutions to issues impacting the student. You might have gone a little quick for me, Sally. Case management finds uh, solutions to issues impacting the student with asthma, both inside and outside of the school and traditional healthcare systems, such as addressing transportation, housing, internet access, and food security, concerns that have been magnified as a result of the pandemic. And most importantly, it promotes self-care and independence. Now you can move, Sally. I want to emphasize case management is school nurse led. It's both a program and a tool for the practicing school nurse to provide consistent approach to care for the student with asthma, reflecting your full scope of professional school nurse in practice. The goal is to coordinate care for the student with asthma so they can successfully self-manage their disease, reducing barriers to academic performance and school engagement while engaging and supporting the entire family. Case management can also provide professional support, benefits for the school nurse and school health services stakeholders by improving the quality of nursing services, contributing to the understanding of the impact and value of the nurse in the school setting, and providing student health and academic outcome data for stakeholders to realize the value of sustaining this approach to meet school priorities. Note how the other practice components of care coordination also come into play. So how does the boots on the ground school nurse implement school nurse-led case management? First, recognize it is something you are already doing. While any student with asthma could benefit from these, there are realities of your practice, time, energy, and resource allocation that pose challenges to implementing case management to all students with asthma. Grounded in this reality, another evidence-based approach can provide guidance. MTSS, or Multiple Tiered System of Supports, an approach used by educators. It grew out of the public health model of primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention, which school nurses recognize. It's comprised of three tiers of support. One, core supports that are, go to all students. Two, supplemental supports that some students receive. And three, intensive supports targeted to the neediest students. From the MTSS model, school nurse-led case management prioritizes students with asthma that are in tier three. So how are these tier three students identified? Through case finding. What sources of data assist with this? Your nursing assessment, done in person or virtually. Attendance, discipline, academic progress reports. Referrals from family, school personnel, or healthcare providers. Health office records, and those healthcare provider orders that just show up at school. What are some of the questions? questions you might ask when case finding? Well, does the student have an asthma diagnosis or do you suspect asthma? How well is the student's asthma manager controlled? Is the student prone to exacerbations or asthma flares that Sally referred to? What is the estimated amount of nursing intervention needed? And how significant are the student's academic issues such as attendance or tardiness? When students with asthma are identified through case finding, it still requires your critical thinking to prioritize students. 
Priorities should be determined along a continuum of student acuity, targeting the highest priority students, such as those who, whose asthma are at higher risk for mor morbidity or mortality. You should also consider the social determinants of health in the community, social emotional factors of the student, comorbidities, students that need improvement in some aspect of their educational process, and students, family, staff, or healthcare providers that require frequent interactions with you. As previously stated, school nurse-led case management is an example of high-level application of the nursing process, infused with key components of the WISC model, and ASN's framework, and the multi-tiered systems of support. So assessment, the first step. In addition to the assessment components that are common to all practice settings, you bring your expertise in school nursing to modify or expand the nursing assessment to a higher level that captures the whole child, including unique logistics, things nurses in other settings don't have to think about, such as getting permission to share information, what kind of equipment is needed at school, the social determinants of health in your community, those things that impact the student, the conditions and places where students and families live, work, and play. The school environment, such as class schedules, school activities, um, out-of-school time activities, and individual factors that you are acutely aware of with your students. Their social needs, exposure to adverse childhood experiences, developmental level, and their self-management skills. So after assessment, next is planning care for a student with asthma. Of course, I'm referring to the development of the IHP. The nursing diagnosis or focus of care is determined after the school nurse critically analyzes the assessment data and confirms the priority of care with the student and family. Next, identify the goal for each nursing diagnosis. Goals promote self-care and independence. They're broad and long-term, and they should be written in a smart format, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. Outcomes are measurable behaviors or benchmarks or action steps to help reach the goal. The nursing diagnosis and related goals and outcomes next guide planning the evidence-based interventions. It's also very important to include student and family preferences here. While healthcare providers got orders um, guide routine and emergency medical care, planning how these orders are implemented at school and or at home requires the critical thinking of the school nurse. Promoting mental health and resilience has long been documented as a need for anyone living with a chronic health condition. Interventions targeting mental health are more important now than ever before, resulting from the stressors endured because of the pandemic. And Sarah, Sally mentioned the importance of student safety. It needs to be a priority focus of school nurse-led case management. NASN, just so you know, differentiates the emergency action plan, a plan that comes from the healthcare provider, from the emergency care plan developed by the school nurse. Either way, it's important to be prepared for a medical emergency. You can also include evidence-based interventions that reflect the independent practice of school nursing, such as health education, self-care strategies, anticipatory guidance, and others. Evaluation, the last step of the nursing process. When goals and outcomes are written in smart format, much of the evaluation plan is already in place. If using nursing delegation, if that's allowed in your state as a strategy to implement care at school or home, you also need to evaluate the delegatee. Evaluation leads to plan revision that is cyclic in nature, sometimes indicating there's no longer the need for intense case management. So I want to mention that the IHP, the Individualized Healthcare Plan, can direct the development of other health plans and educational plans, a way of extending school nurse-led case management to address the whole child. We've already talked about the emergency care plan, but note, while the IHP is for the school nurse, the emergency care plan is shared with those who have responsibility for the student. The IHP does not take the place of a 504 plan, but can provide supplemental guidance when the student has asthma. Same as the 504 plan, the IHP can provide supplemental guidance for the IEP accommodation plan for the student with asthma. The IHP can inform other education plans for students whose asthma can be a key factor interfering with le learning, such as response to intervention or tiered education intervention plans. The IHP can also support the development of transition plans between schools, 
between healthcare setting and school beyond secondary school. And note, transition planning is also a practice component of the care coordination principle. So whether you want to implement, continue, or expand your practice to include school nurse-led case management for students with asthma, or a school or district wants to sustain and build a case <coughs> management program, it's important to identify what you want to measure, what data to collect. Sharing successes from those students that are case managed can demonstrate the critical role you play in helping the school reach its educational mission. Consider structure, process, and outcome measures for both the school nurse, student, and school community that reflect both health and education data points. Examples of these measures are outlined in an upcoming manual I'm going to mention on the next slide, and a sampling is listed on this slide. In addition to collect student and family success stories, data feeds the mind, but stories feed the soul. And be prepared to know who and when you want to present the data. And now I'll jump to this slide. I'd like to use this graphic from the North Carolina Healthy Schools Program to summarize school nurse-led case management as a key strategy to co coordinate care for students with asthma. Case management is not the same as care coordination. I'm going to take a sip of water. <laughs> it's a key practice component of the care coordination principle in the NASM framework. It involves case finding, and a thorough nursing assessment to identify those tier three students with asthma that would most benefit from this approach. It reflects high level application of the nursing process guided by the NASN framework and the WISC and MTSS models. And don't forget the importance of data collection. So this was a quick overview of the role of the school nurse as case manager, manager for students with asthma. To further develop your understanding, I've listed some key resources on this slide, and they're also listed on the references and resources slides. Resources free to NASN members and non-members alike. For example, the NASN webpage, collaboration to support students with chronic health conditions. That was an outcome from the five-year cooperative agreement that Sally mentioned I've been in charge of. The NASN bookstore has resources, including the two principles for practice booklets that are, that are listed on the slide. There's the Improving Care Coordination for Students with Chronic Health Conditions Toolkit that can be found on the NASM Learning Center. And there's a um, CNE offering for free for CNEs, the COVID-19 pandemic and chronic health conditions, the school nurse role in promoting health equity. And the soon to be released Model for School Nurse Lead Case Management Manual that I referred to on the previous slide, built upon work focused on case management done in North Carolina and Washington. That was a quick overview. Liz, I turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Nicole. I appreciate it very much. Hello, everyone. I'm gonna be talking today about asthma in the age of COVID-19. And in general, you know that school-age children have mild illness or are asymptomatic with COVID-19 illness. According to the CDC WWMR report, school-age children with underlying conditions had a higher incidence of severe adverse outcomes related to COVID-19 infection among school-aged children. The data reports that children with at least one underlying health condition, 23% were hospitalized, 38% were admitted to an intensive care unit, and 33% died. Among those with reported data about underlying conditions, chronic lung disease, including asthma, was the most commonly reported um, underlying condition at 7%, which reflects the incidence of asthma in children nationwide. I am positive by now that you are all familiar with the symptoms of COVID-19 in children. Out of the symptoms, only three are the same as an acute asthma exacerbation, cough, shortness of breath, and congestion or runny nose, particularly with coughing. School nurses use their nursing experience with students to identify and implement health care plans. Many students with asthma have been regular visitors to your school health office prior to and during the COVID-19 pandemic, and you're familiar with the student's clinical presentation. Assessment of the student will provide you with the additional clinical information, such as fever, absence of breath sounds or wheezing, and other information, such as exposure to triggers or active COVID-19 illness in the family. School nurses use their critical thinking skills, which is a practice component in the framework principle of standards of practice 
to integrate their knowledge, skills, abilities, and judgment to determine the course of action, such as administering rescue inhalers as authorized by the student's care plan or sending the student home for signs of illness and, or possible COVID-19 infection. According to the CDC guidance, during the COVID-19 pandemic, asthma treatments using inhalers with spacers with or without a face mask, according to each student's individualized treatment plan, are preferred over nebulizer treatments whenever possible in the school setting. It is unknown whether aerosols generated by nebulizer treatments are potentially infectious. So students should use their personal inhaler if possible. If your school has a stock inhaler, the inhaler should be used and cleaned according to the manufacturer's instructions between each use. The American Lung Association's model policy for school districts, stock bronchodilators, recommends using inhalers with disposable spacers and mouthpieces. School nurses should also consider additional strategies to further minimize cross-contamination, including using spacers with one-way valves and not allowing the student to touch the inhaler. The student can touch the spacer, but the school staff administering the inhaler can touch the inhaler. There is limited data from healthcare settings that suggests wiping all surfaces of an inhaler with an alcohol-based wipe containing at least 70% alcohol after inhaler use and then allowing these surfaces to air dry can prevent bacterial cross-contamination. CDC is not aware of data on whether this can prevent viral cross-contamination or transmission in the school setting regarding viral contamination of spacer devices. There was a study on the SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, on plastics, stainless steel, and cardboard surfaces, which showed that the virus can remain viable for up to 72 hours on some surfaces, which highlights the importance of disinfecting. Again, the American Lung Association's model policy for school districts, stock bronchodilators, recommends using inhalers with disposable spacers or disposable mouthpieces. During the COVID-19 pandemic, nebulizer treatments at schools should be used for children who cannot use or do not have access to inhaler, or for children who are in significant respiratory distress while awaiting emergency transport. If a nebulizer is used, CDC recommends the number of people present in the room should be limited to the student and only the staff member administering the treatment. The school nurse or designated staff person would need to wear appropriate PPE for potential aerosol exposure. The school nurse can consider having the student self-administer the nebulizer treatment based on the student's age, level of maturity, and breathing status. The student could be observed from a distance of six feet or greater or outside the room within sight, particularly if there's a window available. Students receiving nebulized breathing treatments should never be left unattended. The room should undergo routine cleaning and disinfection after the treatment is completed. CDC has additional information on how to clean and disinfect and how to prevent asthma attacks triggered by cleaning and disinfecting activities. I love the picture on this next slide. You know, we sort of feel like we've been blasting off into new territory this whole past year. And um, next fall is also going to be a new adventure. You know, the pandemic has created barriers to healthcare access, including routine wellness visits and prescribed medications. Caregivers have lost a employment and access to health insurance. Medications have expired or been misplaced over the extended time at home or the back and forth between home and school. Children have been left at home to manage their asthma and participate in their virtual instruction. These and other factors have highlighted the school nurse role to address health inequities. And looking to the future in their return to school in the fall, students with asthma continue to need the same resources to manage their health care needs at school. As Nicoli and Sally mentioned, a current IHP in healthcare provider authorization for medication administration at school, which of course requires a well child visit to obtain. School nurses will need to use their care coordination skills to provide case management, collaborative communication, and create the IHP and other health plans as needed, as Nicoli mentioned earlier. School nurses are familiar with community resources, such as a federally qualified health center or clinic that provides free or low cost health care to vulnerable student populations. Non-expired rescue medications for school is another issue to address. School nurses can support caregivers in assessing free or low cost medications through the community, state, or pharmaceutical resources. 
There are many programs that school nurses can connect caregivers to, including local pharmacies. Reassurance to caregivers that it is safe for students with asthma to wear a face covering and continue control their medications, including corticosteroids and the management of their asthma. These are serious concerns for caregivers that school nurses are perfectly positioned to address. NASM has over 30 resources for school nurses to support you in the return to school planning. So we're gonna quickly just go through these for you. Um, NASM has developed a COVID-19 reference pages that have resources from NASM, CDC, and some created by school nurse innovators. The first link on the slide will take you to, this ref to these reference pages, and hopefully you've been able to visit this resource. I would like to share a few resources that are specific to asthma. The second link on this page is a document co-authored by NASM and the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, which specifically addresses considerations for the school nurses for students with asthma. And the next link is the health equity document that I mentioned earlier and includes specific data on disparities for COVID-19 and chronic illness, including asthma. It includes resources for the school nurse to address identified social needs. And the final document here addresses students with special health care needs and there is information uh, for students with asthma in it as well. Asthma has two professional development opportunities that are free to NASA members and non-members alike that include CNE and both address asthma and other chronic health conditions and Nicolee mentioned these earlier. Um, just wanted to share just a little bit more about them. Um, the first one is um, the offering was paid for with CDC funding over the past five years and NASA focused on the school nurse role and removing barriers to improve uh, readiness to learn, classroom participation and academic performance for students with chronic health conditions, identifying systems and processes that need to be in place in schools and school districts. And this opportunity focuses on students with chronic health conditions as schools reopen in-person learning during the pandemic. The second opportunity is the educational offering for school nurses with a fresh perspective about what has changed and what has not changed as it relates to school nursing practice and the management of chronic health conditions during the COVID-19 pandemic. Evidence-based current information, tools and resources and strategies will support the confidence and competence of the school nurse role in promoting health equity for at-risk students that have a chronic health condition. Sally, I'm turning it back to you to share the Asthma and Allergy Network resources. Thank you so much, Liz. So uh, Allergy and Asthma Network has so many things available to you as well. And a lot of them are written with the school nurse in mind because uh, you know we, we are just so aware of how important your population is. So we have a program we call Patient Learning Pathways. And this is strictly patient-centered. It is patient-focused information. It's on a variety of health topics. You can see them all here on the, on the right side of the slide, but asthma is right there at the top. These are easy to understand, they're evidence-based, and it's on-demand learning. But these are our um, PowerPoints with a voiceover. And there's, we have three for asthma. There's Asthma 101, Asthma Medications, and Asthma Management. So I, I'd strongly encourage you, if you have a parent who doesn't really understand what asthma is, this would be a great tool for that. We also have a new page on indoor air quality and indoor air pollution. And, and you can find that on our website at allergyasthmanetwork.org. And it's got some great questions here. You know, why is indoor air quality important? How does it affect our health? What are the most common indoor air pollutants? How can indoor air quality be improved? How can air quality be tested? And there's a lot more information than that right there. So we have posters that are available. And I have to tell you, the respiratory treatments poster, we update this about every six months. And this is how I actually got to know the network in the first place. Because I used to say, it before I even knew who the network was, I would say, I can't practice school nursing without this poster. Because so many times a child would come in and they'd say, oh, I had my inhaler. And it'd be like, well, did you take your controller or did you take your quick relief this morning? And they could never tell you, but they could point to the one they used. And so it's a great tool and that's available on our website. You can either do a, a direct download or you can order it in our online store. We really only charge shipping and handling, but these are really um, something that I would strongly suggest you have if you don't already have it. And if you have it, check what the date is because like I, we just up, uh, re, redid it about, oh, maybe like four weeks ago. So we have a brand new version for you with the latest medications. 
We also have a respiratory tools poster. This not only looks at nebulizers, but valve holding chambers and spacers, spirometers, peak flow meters, uh, inspiratory flow meters. And then we did put asthma control tests and action plans on here because we just think those are such valuable tools. We have a lot of COVID-19 resources that relate to asthma. We have a, an infographic on asthma and COVID-19 uh, and talk about what you need to do with protection and prevention. We have another great resource called COVID-19 Myths Busted, uh, with things where uh, that were out in the out kind of on the on the news wires at times that might not have been an, had an evidence-based answer to them. We took those and made sure that we got that correct answer right in there. And this, the next one is an algorithm. And actually, I'll be talking more about this in my presentation for the NASN virtual conference. But this we developed because we realized how important it was going to be for the school nurse to have a tool when a child comes in and says, well, I'm short of breath. So the question is, is it anxiety? Is it COVID-19? Is it asthma? So this is something that uh, you can download off of our website in our COVID-19 um, center. And uh, I'd strongly suggest you take a good look at this because I think it's super helpful and it's been medically reviewed as well. We also uh, made sure that we have posters made for the three W's, uh, wash your hands frequently, watch your distance and wear a mask. So these are available for you in English and Spanish. Most of our resources have a Spanish counterpart. So uh, think about that when you're looking for things. So please check out allergyasthmanetwork.org. We have our online shop and the resources are in there as well as on our information pages. Uh, we have printed posters and we have free downloads. And uh, NASN provided us with a whole lot of fabulous references and resources and that will be on the slides so uh, you can reference that if you'd like to and it keeps going here and now it's time to take your questions so if you have a question please go ahead and write that in the question box on your handout pane right now and we have a first question this one is i have a student that other nurses have said fake wheezing can a student fake a wheeze? The child is a chronic asthmatic. He has purple blue fingers and he has an asthma action plan. I sent him to the ER four times last school year and two this year. His mom often feels I should send him back to class more often, but I hear him wheezing. He has a normal O2 sat, normal heart rate, no signs of respiratory distress, and sometimes an increased respiratory rate. What are your thoughts on that? Once I just heard wheezing in his throat, nowhere else. Just wondering how I can approach this child and adjust my ass assessment skills for him and other students with asthma. Nicolay or Liz, would you like to jump in on that one? <laughs> Sally, I, I think you're probably the best person to answer that question, unless you <laughs> want one of us to take a stab at it. We're happy to do that. Yeah, I'll be happy to. Uh, I want to always err on the side of believing a child anytime they tell me anything. So, can, but can they fake a wheeze? They can, they, can they can sort of fake the sound sometimes. I did actually have a student who could, who could make himself look like he was wheezing, but you're right. You know, you can do your assessment and get all your information. And um, sometimes he would have uh, that expiratory wheeze on auscultation with the stethoscope, and sometimes he wouldn't. And, um, and it, I, got, I kind of got a little bit, um, I want to say wise to uh, his his patterns because uh, he really he just wheezed terribly sometimes when he came in and sometimes it seemed incredibly legitimate and other times I kind of scratched my head but it turned out both his parents were um, were residents and so they were gone from home a lot and the, often he would have a an a, a, a asthma flare or something that looked like an asthma flare on a day where he hadn't seen them in about three days. And of course they ran over to the health office if he was having a bad flare and he got to see them. And so we questioned that, we worked that through with the parents. But like I said, always err on the side of believing a child, but then gather your empirical data too. You know, it, I, I, I don't know, what the take these days is on having a peak flow meter in the um, health office. Some people are all behind that and some people aren't. 
if you do decide to have one, you should have a protocol for what you do based on what reading you get. But, uh, but certainly you could do a good assessment uh, with your stethoscope, with, uh, with you know, taking pulses and vitals and all that, and, and really put together that, that subjective data with the objective data. And this is where good nursing assessment skills come into play. Do you guys have anything you want to add or did I get it for you? You certainly got the, okay. um, oh, I'm sorry. This is what happens when you've got friends um, doing this webinar and we kind of talk over each other. <laughs> I, just ahead, add, I just wanted to add, you know, um, it sounds like you have already engaged the family and you're trying to listen to the student. Um, if you're in the role as case manager, don't forget to loop in the healthcare provider or any other specialist. So maybe this is the time to update that individualized student-centered approach to care and update the emergency action plan and the IHP. Maybe the healthcare provider has some uh, tips on what, how to maybe pre-medicate or medicate at the time. But again, just you as case manager kind of being that bridge between the medical home, the family, the school, and the student kind of pulling everybody together. Yeah, Nickley, this is Liz. I, I agree. I, I was going to suggest involving the health provider also um, and maybe getting the student in for an updated visit if, if it's been a while since they've been in. The other thing is, you know, that data collection that you mentioned, um, really figuring out what time of day these are things are happening. Is there a trigger that you're seeing? Is it, you know, after PE or recess? Um, or, you know, is it during math or, you know, some, uh, some academic piece where the child is not engaged and not interested in um, talking to the teacher and other school personnel who observe the student throughout the day and sort of see what's going on. So, um, you know, I, I would, you know, involve the whole school community and um, in that data collection and, and help you formulate a, a plan for moving forward with the student. Well, like Liz brought up, you know, anxiety can really uh, play into an asthma flare. So check out, you know, are they struggling in math? And it's at math every day. Uh, so so I, actually, I had one student, I, I said that he had a condition called asthma mathematicus because he just really struggled at math. And it was a great way to get out of the classroom when things got too hot for him. So, yeah, but I think you're, it sounds like you're asking all the right questions and thinking all the right things. Our next question is, is it possible to get a copy of these slides? And the answer is yes. We'll have them posted on our website along with the recording of the webinar within about 48 hours. Okay, so this is someone who wants to confirm that if a student has moderate to severe asthma at school, the school nurse should ask for an asthma action plan. Who would like to take that one? Again, I think that this is Nicole. That's the best practice to get that from the healthcare provider. Other chronic illnesses don't necessarily have action plans. So it's the school nurse role to, you know, from the healthcare provider orders and your nursing assessment to develop an emergency care plan. That's why we differentiate the two. But asthma in particular, it's very common. It's common practice for the healthcare provider to have an emergency action plan that clearly outlines um, the med medical response um, for that particular student. And this is Liz. I would just add that I wouldn't limit it to just students with moderate to severe asthma um, because there is those incidents of any student with an asthma diagnosis could have um, an incident uh, flare up at school, you know, based on a trigger or something, you know, feeling sick, something going on. So, um, you know, it's always great to be prepared and, and have an inhaler rescue medication there in the event that you need it. So it may be a student you only see once a year, um, but I would rather be prepared than and then not and have an emergency and have to call 911. Okay, our next question is, what are the best ways to coach a student on how to respond to asthma symptoms related to heightened emotions. I'm definitely passing that one on. <laughs> uh, this is Liz, I can start and Sally, you can add in. Um, you know, I think um, as children mature, um, our students, you know, it's important for them to learn self-care and learning about their asthma. There's some great programs out there through the American Lung and other organizations that um, you can provide as a school nurse educational programs for students to learn about self-management and 
um, you know, certainly relaxation and mindfulness um, is an important part of that. Um, NASA does have some resources um, to uh, put into practice for school nurses on recognizing and, and intervening with students that are having um, anxiety and stress, not specific to asthma, but just in general. And I would encourage you to check those out. Sally, do you have anything to add? Not so much. I think you you touched on that just beautifully. But yeah, it's it, and that's all I think, you know, I what the biggest thing I think of when I think about why does a school want a school nurse? And it always to me comes down to the value of nursing assessment because nobody else in the school is taught to physically and 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 mentally assess a student like we are. And I think that's something you should always make sure that you highlight when you're talking to school administration and and others. But, uh, but this is one of those moments for really great assessment skills to see, you know, try to work on, you know, what's the cause of the asthma exacerbation. You know, it might be something more simple, like, like uh, there's a girl wearing perfume sitting next to them in class, and it might not be that simple. So I think that's definitely something to always think about. So our next question is, do you recommend any asthma apps for school students to use, such as Kiva Asthma Advisor? that I use for my child? Well, that's a great question. A Allergy and Asthma Network does have an asthma app called Asthma Storylines. And you can put that just right into the search bar on our website, Asthma Storylines. And it's, it's, I think it's a great app for tracking asthma. We also, it does track uh, emotions and it has medication reminders and things like that in it. So I think that's something you would enjoy. Oh, we got so many questions. We'll have to just run down the list here. Uh, something, will I be able to download the webinar? The webinar will be available and a PDF of the slides will be available. Uh, you'll get, you'll either get a link or you can go always to allergyasthmanetwork.org, go to news and webinars and you'll find them all there. Okay, is the criteria where, what is the criteria whereby an asthma IHP is recommended? Many parents say that their children have asthma, but no inhaler. It's a question that comes up a lot at school. Well, I, this is Nicole. Um, again, it goes back to case finding, to identify, not, and case finding is used to identify any student that might have a health concern or academic concern that requires your attention. After the case finding, the next step is figuring out that tier three, unless you are lucky enough to have staffing that you could do uh, do case management on all students. So students with a with a, a uh, identified health concern that's interrupting their learning, um, that kind of rises to the top, the importance of developing an IHP. And that, again, you're, I, you're, I'm speaking with my NASN, your the school nurse professional nursing organization speaking from our scope and standards document that requires that really um, puts lays out the importance of developing an IHP but again you need that a connection with the healthcare provider if there are going to be medical treatments that are going to happen in the school and like you probably what I'm hearing in this question is you'd like to really um, understand if there really is a diagnosis of asthma and that's got to come from the healthcare provider Okay, our next question. If an inhaler is used by only one child, how should the canister and inhaler itself be cleaned? Is it okay to repeatedly take the canister apart from the plastic holder? Not referring to the spacer, just the canister and inhaler. Well, I could take this one. Actually, we have a section in one of our patient learning pathways that talks about cleaning inhalers. If you have a dry powder inhaler, you should never get that one wet. That should just get wiped with a cloth. But if you've got the, the, the canister type, you can take it apart. I don't think it needs to be cleaned after every use, but you certainly do want to clean it occasionally. And you just want to rinse it out and you want to dry it well and you can put it right back together. So that, but you do need to consider um, cleaning your inhalers. Okay, can you please share what you know about asthma management during the pandemic, pandemic uh, such as data on hospitalizations and medication use? and how those differed during the pandemic and why? What are you concerned about as children return to school? Mm. Well, that, this is Liz, that, that's a great question. And because um, of the 
incidence, higher incidence of students with underlying health conditions, including asthma, having a more severe response to COVID, you know, that's certainly a concern in the return to school this fall, you know, um, many mitigation measures such as uh, mask wearing and things um, have maybe will not be in place as more students are vaccinated. So that certainly is a concern. Um, and, and the choose to the choice to vaccinate or not is going to also uh, make a difference in whether or not that child is old enough, you know, qualifies to be vaccinated to protect them. So um, like anything, you think about, um, you know, the flu and people with chronic health conditions, you know, for years, um, influenza vaccine has been recommended for people with asthma. And um, I'm sure the COVID-19 um, immunization vaccine also is recommended. So, you know, th there's a lot. Th those are um, some brief things that come to mind to me. And I wonder, you know, Sally, if you had anything or Nickley that you'd like to add? No, I think you got it there. Okay. Okay, we have fabulous school nurses on the line today, uh, and and maybe it's somebody who is uh you know has is uh got is a nurse practitioner or or uh, physician, but we've had several comments that went back to that first incident when we talked about the student and possibly the fake wheeze, and the, here's one of the comment. I've been in pediatrics for 17 years, and I always listen to the throat to determine if the wheezing is coming from the upper airway and her have and that will happen in a child having vocal cord dysfunction. Seen a lot of asthma diagnosis that then become an upper airway issue. So you need to be diligent in knowing that viruses that will cause asthma-like presentations still need to be treated, uh, treated and upper airway can be just as severe if not more. And it's I'm really glad this was brought up, the vocal cord dysfunction, because I had a student, and I gotta tell you, it looks like asthma, but it doesn't respond to asthma treatments and vocal cord dysfunction. Years ago, I wrote an article for NASN School Nurse on vocal cord dysfunction. It's it's pretty fascinating. And um, and that is something you should think about uh, when, when you're looking at um, different things. Okay, we have time for just one question more, and that's going to go to our NASN friends. The question is, is the book School Nursing Scope and Standards of Practice available for purchase on NASM? Absolutely. And just be um, aware that it is currently being updated, um, not by NASN, because um, that's a joint publication between our mothership, American Nurses Association, and NASN. So yes, you can get it at the NASN bookstore. I would just like to put a plug in that I think every school nurse should have the scope and standards on their desk because it's the standard we're held to as school nurses. And I think it's just so important to be sure that we're working up to the level and of, of, of the best standard possible. So, and uh, Nicolee, I uh, had so many versions of our slide deck, but the one we have right now, I don't have your beautiful slide for the conference coming up. So if you would just like to speak to the NASN conference, uh, we would love to have, have you uh, talk about that for just a second. Absolutely. I just want to let every, remind everybody, the school nurses that are on the call in particular, that our virtual conference is June 21st to 25. You can go to nasn.org, our homepage, and click on the conference page. There you'll get information about the program, meet the speakers, there's a justification toolkit if you need help justifying um, the cost and maybe your employer would cover that cost and much more. So you, you can earn up to 24.25 CNE. And this year we also have the virtual plus courses for an additional 10 CNE. And there's several opportunities for uh, being planned to foster particip participant engagement. Um, Brain Dates is a new um, opportunity to have an intimate video chat on a variety of topics. And if you belong to a state affiliate or a special interest groups, they are gathering as well. So hope to quote unquote, see you at the conference, June 21st to 25. Well, I would like to thank Nicole and Liz for being with us today. Appreciated everything we had to share. And I'd like to thank our listeners for listening today as we looked at Asthma Care at School. We hope that this will help with both asthma, with asthma management at both home and at school. We'd love to have you join us for our next webinar next week called Food Allergy from Home to School. This will be held on June 8th at 3 o'clock p.m. 
we're going to talk about food allergy basics and important school considerations. This is one where you might want to ask your parents to tune in as well. We'll have some great information for them. So thank you again for joining us. This is Sally Schessler for the staff at Allergy and Asthma Network. Please join us as we work together to improve health outcomes so we can all breathe better together.